Thank you, Bob. Well, that was great. Hopefully, everyone, uh, everyone is now better informed about what's going on with the, uh, with the OpenFlow standard. And as you saw, the website there, if you need to go to it, uh, for more information after the, after the summit's over, um, you've got access to that as well. So next, what I wanted to do is bring up Stu Elby from Verizon, not only on the board, but also going to be telling you about how Verizon's going to be uh, adopting their, uh, their open flow and software-defined networks. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Tim. All right. Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is, my, how you've, how you've grown since I was here in October. This is huge. Um, if you were here in October, which is a room maybe, what, about a third this size, uh, I talked a little bit about what Verizon was thinking about with uh, software-defined networks and OpenFlow. And I wanted to use this time to talk a little more about status of where we are, what we're doing, and talk about uh, some ideas that are just launching now. So let me start with the framework that's driving Verizon's view. Okay? And it, it's about cost, and it's about capabilities. So what you see here is a diagram that's supposed to illustrate, in some sense, how legacy network services are deployed today. So you see a bunch of network elements, which are sort of arbitrary routers and switches. You see some firewalls and load balancers and some database components. And those red stars really indicate where there is service intelligence distributed across the network. And that's really how networks have been built, at least for the last two or three decades in the carrier space. The problem with that is every time we want to make a change to a service capability, we're typically touching more than one element. We're touching maybe all of those elements indicated here. They're presumably all from different vendors, or at least a, 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 an arrangement of vendors. And we have to go in and carefully orchestrate as the carrier how we upgrade and create those services uh, to get a unified service capability across those elements. So very time consum consuming, operationally very complex. And that's one of the reasons it takes so long and costs so much for uh, tier one carriers to introduce new services and capabilities. All right, so what's changed? Well, the enablers have certainly been maturing over the last decade. It's not something brand new. But certainly the ability to do high performance uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, computing, right? the ability for uh, traditional servers now to handle real-time communications, not just transactional data processing offline, but to handle 10 and 20 gigabit streams in real time. All right? The ability to separate hardware and software very carefully so that I can choose my software platforms independently from whose servers and whose storage arrays I'm using. And now, of course, the ability in the data centers to do virtualization so I can get some multi-tenancy and some efficiency of, those, of that hardware, of the storage, of the compute resources, and build up to scale with high utilization. So what does all that mean? Well, we certainly know what it means to the enterprise and to the IT organizations, the CIOs, who've been taking advantage of these enablers for quite some time. But what does it mean to a carrier like Verizon? Well, it gives us new service opportunities. Right? Service elasticity is an important one. Now, if we build our services in software, we can think about turning up more capability or more resources, if you will, more service uh, resource, and turn it back down as needed as demand swells and diminishes. Right? In traditional networks, that's not so much the case. We're putting it in ahead of time, hoping it gets used based on a forecast. Sometimes we're right. Actually, many times we're, we're under forecasting, and then we're scrambling over a three or six month period to try to build in the capacity we need. If it's software based, we can turn it up and turn it down um, where we need it and when we need it. Global presence is part of that, where we need it. Typically, in a traditional network, your services that are tied to the elements are tied to a geography where you physically place those elements. As we get into uh, software as providing services over our ubiquitous global IP network, I can move those services around the globe wherever I need to. They're not tied to a specific geography or a specific domain. Uh, that gives me the ability to do some things that I haven't been able to do before in terms of migrating service. And lastly, and, and, but maybe the, the most obvious, is speed to market. Now if I'm talking about introducing software, we know that Software gets introduced at a much higher rate of velocity in terms of its development, its tests, the whole you know, test dev process into production uh, versus having to wait for that same software, let's say, to be embedded into a switching or routing element, which unfortunately then has to go through a very onerous regression testing phase, right? because you probably still have code running on that router from six years ago or eight years ago. And even though it may not be very important to you anymore, it's still there, and you have to regression test against all of that code. So it's a long time getting a uh, piece of code on a router or a switch through that process. So these are the opportunities 
that it gives us to start moving the service intelligence off of the network elements and into what I'm calling a centralized data center. Now, this is logically a centralized data center. Of course, for resiliency, we're going to have this spread out ge geographically across our global network. But we can think of it as a centralized entity for doing service control. So this is really, in our minds, what software-defined networking is about. It's moving the service intelligence off of the elements and freeing them up as pure software on our choice of hardware in data centers. All right, so let me talk a little bit about what we've already done with this commercially and then where we're going and then how that fits into OpenFlow. Because as it's shown here, I haven't really talked about OpenFlow yet, just the idea of moving the services into data centers. So I hinted at, at traffic steering and talked a little bit about it last October, but now this is real. This is in Verizon Wireless's network at this point. As you know, it's a, it's a big network. It's a domestic network, but 100 million plus subscribers using it. And this is use something we call content management and distribution. All right? and it's, uh, but it's, we don't call it a CDN because it's much more complex than a CDN. I don't know if any of you have had personal experience watching video on a mobile network. So not on Wi-Fi, but actually on your mobile network. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. And the issue is that the protocols and mechanisms that, that we have, as an industry have developed with leaders like Akamai uh, have developed for delivering content close to the user with CDNs work very well when, when the changes in the network are slow. Congestion builds up slowly, congestion relieves itself slowly, and the whole concept of available bit rate and chunking of content works very well in that mechanism where you're sensing on the client device the buffer fill and then using that information to determine what bit rate or, or what coding rate should be used to be sent to you. The problem is on a mobile network, things don't work that nicely. On a mobile network, congestion occurs very quickly and relieves itself very quickly uh, beyond the time frames that ABR can handle. So you know, I've certainly experienced, I don't know if you have, if you try to watch a lot of video on, it, on an iPad that's connected to the mobile network, not the uh, not a Wi-Fi network, you'll definitely find that that will happen. It'll freeze, it'll stop, it doesn't, doesn't behave that well. So really what you want to do is you want to have real-time knowledge of what's happening on the radio access network and use that to trigger the bit rates you're going to use to deliver the content. All right? and, and as the wireless carrier, we know that information long before your device sees that in terms of buffer flow. So we have sort of a, a preview as to what's happening on the, on the RAN, and we can take advantage of that. So the general model here is that we're monitoring in real time congestion on the sectors where the users are so we understand exactly what sort of latencies and bandwidths all those flows are, 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 you know, are, are being delivered on. And we also then have information about the content coming into the network, whether it's our own video content or YouTube or Hulu or whatever it is. And we can then make decisions on what to do, how to deliver that content. If it's coded appropriately so that it can be delivered uh, as is, it will just go into a cache streamer and get delivered out. Um, we can decide if we need to drop down to a lower rate or bump up to a higher rate. We don't have to wait for the ABR mechanism to kick in, so we can just do that almost as a proxy for ABR. Or in some cases, you might be going to some site that hasn't done ABR and it has a fixed bit rate of coding, and that coding is just not going to work on your device at that point in time. It's going to look horrible. It's going to freeze. It's not going to give you a good customer experience. In that case, we can move that traffic over to a real-time transcoder that will knock down the bit rate, so at least you get it. Because what we find is people tend to rather get you know, slow video, if you will, lower, lower frame rate video that's smooth versus having it freeze up and just be unacceptable. All right? But that, you have to do that on a flow-by-flow -flow basis and in real time making those decisions. So we've applied SDN to accomplish that. And that's what's illustrated at a very high level here. We have something called Traffic Optimizer that's getting real-time traffic modeling information off of the cells. And then it's pulling in the traffic flows that are coming into our network, and it's making decisions on how to steer that and, and what content to actually use. So here's a, a bullet list of some of the attributes that we're routing on in real-time steering of these flows. It's based on the subscriber uh, profile, if you will, the policies, what you've signed up for. It's based on the type of application. It's based possibly on the URL you're trying to get to, the cache. It's could also be based on the real-time congestion right in the RAN, which I've already discussed, and the performance and availability of the servers that are going to provide this. Uh, the point I'm making, because you can probably come up with a laundry list of other items that we can route on, is that these are items that, although you could push them down into the IP routing framework, are very, very difficult to do that. Each of these would be a, a sort of major undertaking to add this level of non-traditional, you know, you know non-dijkstra, if you will, capabilities into the routers to move this around. So we're doing it all in software across our data centers now, and it works. 
And the problem, of course, is that we're chewing up an awful lot of resources and interfaces on all these servers to handle this in real time uh, because all the flows have to move through these boxes. All right? there's, no, there's no shortcuts here. So this is where we are today. And it's fine as we start to roll this out and, and starting to grow the use of this. But we clearly see that at some point, even this being a, an advantage over the old way of doing things, runs out of steam. And this is where OpenFlow comes in as something we need to get to. So here's just an example of that same network if we have OpenFlow capability. So in, in the previous diagram, I didn't show routers or switches at all. But of course, that cloud is made up of routers and switches. So here I'm just showing one. Of course, there's multiple. If that's a hybrid OpenFlow router, um, ideally, I'd have an open flow controller with some API speaking to my traffic optimizer. And in that case, I'd be looking at a flow and saying, gee, this is a long-lived you know, long video flow. Let's set up a, an explicit path, a shortcut path, using open flow through the switch router infrastructure so that I can directly go to where I need to go. And that way, I'm not processing the entire flow through all these elements. So this will offload a lot of those interfaces and allow this SDN to scale much more gracefully as usage goes up on it. So this is not what we have yet. This is the target of where we'd like to go to. Let me give one other example of SDN and how it relates. If, if you think back to the first diagram I showed of, of distributed intelligence, uh, that diagram is a very good example of IMS. Now, IMS is a standard that I won't go into. It stands for IP, multimedia subsystem, but it's what um, the, the mobile carriers, the wireless carriers, particularly those that are doing LTE, use as the mechanism to give QoS and route traffic for voice telephony video and all other forms. So if you use Verizon Wireless's LTE network today, today, if you have a 4G handset, it's running through our IMS backbone. IMS is built with a distributed intelligence, as I showed in that first picture, which limits how we can do it, where we can do it. And it turns out that that network's really not optimized for some use cases. When we built it, we were thinking about hundreds of millions of subscribers like you and me. Right, so a subscriber is a human being that has a billing address, that has a subscriber profile, and signs up for some services. But that's not a model that my refrigerator or my dishwasher or my car want to use. I, I don't bill them. Uh, instead of a few hundred million, there's probably a few billion of those sort of things that connect with IP, you know, their IP endpoints. They have to come through this, uh, this same cloud. Uh, another example, so we call those subscriberless services, but uh, more, more traditionally think of them as machine to machine. Machine to machine doesn't fit well into the same IMS architecture that was designed for humans. Right? Another example would be uh, the case of private networking. A large global enterprise wants to put their own services and their own twists into their video conferencing capabilities and their telephony capabilities. Again, carving out virtual private networks in traditional IMS is very difficult. It can be done but it's complex and costly. So those were two use cases we said, can we move IMS into a virtualized instance into the cloud right, and offer that way, uh, particularly for those use cases. And the idea was to get from long deployment cycles like I discussed, you know, 24 months, 12 months, take your pick. Failure analysis being very complex when you have services logic distributed across multiple elements across a network. So it becomes more of a reactive uh, failure analysis. When we move this into a data center, we become much more proactive and predictive in failures. Uh, failure domains today in IMS tend to be very large, and they're geographic. I mean, you're building out a, a network geographically. Uh, if we virtualize this, we can make the domains as, as big or as small as we choose. So we have a lot more control over the risk. Uh, also, asset utilization. When you build a traditional network with service logic, you build typically for peak load, whenever that is during the year. You, know, you can think of uh, Mother's Day or Valentine's Day or take your pick. Um, Super Bowl, right? it, it's, uh, and, and then even then you're looking to build it to be about 80% used. So your average utilization across the year is very, very low on our traditional network. But we know in data centers we don't do that. I mean, if, if you run a data center even just for, as a back office for IT, you're aiming for about 80% average utilization because it's easy to spin more up if you need it and spin down if you don't. So again, an advantage we get by virtualizing this. And then the cost reduction, because of all those things, again, should be on the order of 10x. We expect an order of magnitude improvement on cost structure. So this is something with, with a collaboration of uh, partners we're building and, and prototyping and expect this, again, to move into the network. And again, there is a role for open flow. Day one, this sits in data centers. But how do I route traffic to here? If I'm a subscriber home to a, a, a homing router, because this is, this is mobile IP, so I'm on mobile IP, and I'm, I'm in New Jersey. So my router is someplace in the New Jersey, New York area. And now I'm in Amsterdam, and I want to get those services. 
The way it works today, by the way, in LTE is I'd actually have to home all the way back to that router. And that's how it works. It's very inefficient in mobile uh, networks today because they never really accounted for people moving large distances and doing these multimedia things. Now, with this, I don't have to do that because I can spin up an instance of your services locally out of our Amsterdam uh, you know, data center. Not a, not a big problem. But then I, of course, don't want to home you back through that router. So I want to move the router instance around as well. And that gets into how we would start moving uh, routes around using a control plane for forwarding that's separated from the underlying infrastructure. So where do we all see this all going? And this, I think, lines up with what Dan just spoke about. Right, today, and this is just my view, so we can argue about it, uh, basically you have services, and you have really what I see as open flow controllers today are a combination of orchestration and open flow controllers. They do a lot of things. They are using the standard open flow interface down to the open flow switches. You still have somewhat proprietary uh, protocols going down to the virtual machine controllers. I just call them VMCs there, but you know, how, how is this orchestration and control layer speaking to VMware, Xan, or anything else? Where do we need it to get to? That, that's on the uh, right-hand side of this diagram here. We see orchestration really should be separated with well-defined interfaces, standardized interfaces, if you will, to the open flow controllers. Because we expect we'll be in multiple domains where we'll have maybe one vendor's open flow controller domain someplace and another vendor's open flow controller someplace else, but orchestration has to expand those. We need the hybrid switches, which are already being worked, and possibly an east-west interface because even though we'd like to think all customers on Verizon's network, they're not. So there'll be multiple orchestration layers that may need between domains that may need to communicate as well. So there's a lot of room here for additional standardization. I'll go through this very quickly, just some gaps we see. I think major gaps really, I'll just hit on these without reading through these, are the, um, we really need to tie together the network resources with the data center resources in a common way for ourselves as a service provider and for our enterprise customers as, as IT organizations to use this. All right? um, open flow resolves a lower part of this, but not the whole orchestration layer. And we also need a lot of tools uh, for monitoring, diagnostics, the whole OAM function. Again, that spans seamlessly the network side of the equation and the data center side of the equation. Towards this, we have formed a collaboration uh, I call it an innovation center, although it's a virtual center, it's not in one physical place. Uh, it's to look at prototypes demonstrating how we span the network and the cloud computing data centers together seamlessly. And it, it's a joint initiative between Verizon, HP, and Intel. And we expect to bring in a set of ecosystem partners along the way. Uh, this, this started up fairly recently. You can come to our booth and see some demonstrations. Our first ecosystem partner is uh, Adara Networks providing an orchestration layer as part of this for us, but we'd expect a, a lot of others, presumably in this room, to start partnering with us in this innovation center, trying to tackle some of those gaps and some of those problems related to tying the network to the data center. All right, so I'll wrap up with that and open it up to questions. I think uh, this is really a reiteration, and this will be online, so you can read through the, uh, the summary here. Thank you. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, I appreciate that uh, Verizon has a very immensely complicated task of managing gobs of traffic. And that's a hard problem. Uh, you mentioned most in your last slide that you have this innovation center. Where is this so far? Not physically, where is it? How far along are you? Have you done anything to test open flow in any of these situations? Do you have open flow running on any devices whatsoever? Or is this simply your plans to do this? All right, so uh, good question. Uh, the innovation started uh, l last year. The innovation center, getting the partners together, getting, getting the space together. We're just kind of finished building the space. It, it does include open flow. It's not in the production network. So this is in, in labs at Verizon and at HP at this point. Um, in terms of what we're actually doing with it, though, if you go to the booth, uh, you'll, you'll see there's Intel, HP, and Verizon have booths next to each other. You can see some of the demonstrations that are, in fact, using OpenFlow, tying this together. So it is our intent to get ecosystem partners to work together with us in this lab environment to tackle some of those problems that we still see as gaps. And as we solve those, we'll be moving it into production. And can I assume that in addition to OpenFlow, you're testing a number of ideas? 
Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, at things really hitting upon uh, the issues we see with uh, OA&M. You know, how do you monitor and manage a network built like this? Uh, some of the gaps in some of those other interfaces. You know, how do you sort of standardize the framework between uh, the open flow controller and the orchestration layer? And as we learn these gaps, by the way, we'll drive them back into ONF. I mean, if they warrant standardization, we're going to take the, those learnings back into ONF. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, a question about how you're going to do the video distribution services when you're talking about real-time video, and whether you're planning to do similar sort of pathing for long-lived flows that are derived from things like FaceTime or Google Hangouts or similar peer-to-peer uh, -peer video applications. So the first part is yes, we, we are planning on doing this, and we are doing this for uh, linear and live video, not just VOD. Uh, so yes, we, we can do that. Um, but, you know, again, the, the SDN uh, capabilities we have do allow us to do that in real time. Uh, we haven't really looked at going down into more of the user-generated, particularly, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, fraying or, or you know, pick, pick your favorite uh, video conferencing. Um, that's, that's a little harder because it's, it's, it's two different endpoints, not just sort of internet server to an endpoint. Um, it's an interesting problem. We haven't tackled that one yet. I guess if we solve this one, that will be the next thing to tackle. All right, well, thank you. Great job, Stu. So I've got a question for Stu. I just want to know, is it a coincidence that you said you live in New Jersey, and knowing that I'm from Boston, when you said, I don't know what the busiest call days are, I don't know, the Super Bowl, and you <laughs> stared right at me? Was that a little Patriots-Giants dig? Well, it might have been. All right, I just wanted to check that out. I thought so. You guys couldn't see it. He was standing up here, and he just turned and looked right at me and said, Super Bowl. So Stu's also being pretty modest about what Verizon's doing with their LTE IMS development as well. So when you talk across the industry and what's going on there, they're absolutely cutting edge, leading the way for basically the globe for mobile carriers and what they're doing in that environment. So the fact that they're also looking at how SDN and OpenFlow can help them, again, really helping to push the technology and push the limits of what can be done. So great job there.